Well, I am. And you really shouldn't do that. If I told you the truth, well, you must believe every word I say. Otherwise, I have very little talent. This is the script tonight. <laughs> and uh, the reason I'm not going to do what I planned to do was the irony of all this is so damn funny. Jack Power comes home, a standing ovation. At 10.30 this morning, I kid you not, they would not let me in the elevator. I came with my, 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 my coat and, and, and my, these clothes and the girl, little black girl, said, you can't go up. I said, I'm Jack Parr. I, you, you've never heard of Jack Parr? And she said, no. And I, I said, well, don't you have a list that shows what's going to be on the air tonight and it'll say Jack Parr. She says, I don't have it. I, you mean to tell me I cannot go in that elevator? She said, no. I said, do you realize that I probably paid for those elevators in my day? <laughs> Before me, they used to use ropes to go up and down here. <laughs> well, the poor thing was only following instructions. So somebody came by and got up. Now, everything I tell you is true. So Miriam and I went out walking around because I'm scared. And, we, and we're in front of radio, in uh, front of your, uh, you know, where the, where the fountain is, uh, the, swim, you know, the, the, the skating rink. And there's a bunch of tourists there, and they've got cameras, and they're going like this. They want to photograph. And one lady behind me, she said something about, this is the temple of television where all the stars are. She's going like this. <laughs> and then she asked me to move. She said, would you move? I, I mean, a member, a member of this crew, a young man, told me he called his girl and said to her that he wouldn't have the date tonight because he had to tape a show with Jack Parr. She said, is that P-A-A-R? He said, yes. She said, he's famous. He said, have you ever seen him? She said, no, I'm only 22. I, ne I never saw him. Wait, well, then how can he be famous? And the kid said, he's in all the crossword puzzles. <laughs> I gave, um, I gave my name, I'm, I mean, I'm not on television anymore, and my name is no longer in headlines like it used to be. I feel like George Bush in a way, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I gave my name, uh, I gave my name a credit card at a hardware store, and a lady said to me, you're Jack Parr, and I said, yes, I'm Jack Parr, and she said, when are you coming back? God, I loved you, and I said, oh, I'm never coming back. I, I have no plans, and she said, dear God, to think I'll never hear you sing again. <laughs> the only problems I have, really, are, are short-term memory. As, I, as you get older, as you get older, uh, short-term memory, and I had a physical last year, and I said to the doctor, the only thing, I feel, really feel wonderful, and I'm in very good shape, except I, 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 I don't know where I am a lot of the time. <laughs> I was in Westport the other day, and I said, I live in Greenwich. What the hell am I doing in Westport? Well, so I asked the doctor, I said, now what can you give me for short-term memory? I swear to you, this is true. And he said, well, never mind, the exam. And I did the coughing bit. You fellas know the coughing and all that. <laughs> the chandelier bit and all that stuff. So finally, <laughs> so finally I said, look, I heard the health store say that they have uh, miracle drugs now and, and uh, lecithin or something. And would that be good for me for the short-term memory? He said, never mind. He took a prescription pad and he wrote on it. And I put it in my pocket. And I was so happy to think that there is something that would help me. And I went to the drugstore and I gave it to the druggist and I swear to you what it said, for short-term memory, make notes. <laughs> now, um, the, may I talk to you, senior citizens, please? Um, the, the big thing uh, that, that, that I have found about short-term memory is that I read this marvelous thing by a sexologist which interested me and which I pass on to you. It's, good news. Of all the human faculties that we have, hearing and all those faculties, the last to leave us is your sexual desire and the ability to, 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 to make love. 
that, that, that is quite true what I have just said. And uh, which is good news for free people everywhere, you know, who are, are concerned about that because uh, that means that long after we're wearing bifocals or hearing aids, we'll be making love, but we won't know with whom. So, uh, so make notes. <laughs> I assume I'll be back in a moment. <laughs> it is a popular legend, and it is wrong, that Ed Sullivan was the first to bring the Beatles to this country. It is a part of uh, the legend that he was on the Sullivan Show first. The first time the Beatles were ever seen was on the Sullivan Show. The press says that. Uh, your game of trivia says that. It's not true. I had the Beatles on by film. I had seen them in London and had them filmed. Now I'll admit to you, I never knew that these boys would change the history of the world's music, which they did. I thought it was funny, and I had them filmed and brought it to America months before Sullivan. And now I want to show you, and the reason we're going to show just a little bit of it is that there's something I say after uh, their little act which proves it. Would you show the Beatles, please? I just show you this in case you're going to England and want to have a fun evening. Here are the Beatles. to our cultural level. Ed Sullivan's going to have the Beatles on live uh, in February, and we only, our interest was just showing a more adult audience that usually follows my work. Uh, whenever, whenever I saw the Beatles, uh, as they became the, the greatest musical act in the history of show business, uh, I always felt sad because <laughs> it's my own feeling that um, when they split up the money, Ringo didn't get a full share. <laughs> so don't you have a feeling that Ringo did not get a full quarter of the thing? Okay, here's a good story. Now, here's a good story, but you're gonna, you're gonna outguess me on this one. But at, it, at its time, 18, 20 years ago, it had enormous impact. But you'll outguess it. Not because you're so smart, although I know you are, but it's going to become more obvious than it was. A young kid wanted to get on, the sh uh, on, on television with me, and she was 16 years old, and I said, okay, she, she was quite good. And uh, we set a date, and then all of a sudden, uh, her mother told me she couldn't go on under her right name. So uh, we had to change the, the, the name to some crazy name. It was something like... Uh, <laughs> Duji Langar, which sounded uh, Armenian or Gypsy-like, and so I have to introduce this youngster under this phony name. I get a phone call the night before. She fell and broke her leg. So I said, well, tell the child that I'll put her on, but we can't put her on with a broken leg. Okay. Call comes back, and it says, she's crying. And you not only got a broken leg and a broken heart, she wants to go on. This is her big chance. Okay, how am I going to handle it? Uh, a Hung uh, uh, Armenian w with a broken leg <laughs> under, called Duji Langar. <laughs> well, they got a wheelchair, and they're backstage. They're wheeling her out, and I hear a scream, and I run. I said, what is going on? What's wrong? And they said, we're trying to lift her off of the wheelchair onto on the ladies, onto the potty, and the door slammed, and now she has her arm. <laughs> so... This kid was brought out in a wheelchair with a broken leg, Doogie Langar, 
uh, with, with a thing. Now, who do you think it was? Look. The way you wear your hat. The way you sit your teeth. The memory of all that. No, no, they can't take that away from me. The way your smile just beams. The way you sing off. I told you it's true, except she's not Armenian, <laughs> and she's not a gypsy, and her name isn't Diju Langar. It's Judy Garland's daughter. <laughs> well, I didn't know. But every other word I said was true, and her mother said, if you want to put her on, you've got to put her on without saying who she is and let her sing as scared as she is, if that's what she wants. <laughs> But don't tell them who she is. And it is true about your hands, and it is true about you. She broke her foot last night. What's going to happen to that show you were going to go into? I don't know, really. All I know is that I'm in best foot forward, and I put my best foot forward, and I broke it. Oh. <laughs> so, well, I can get you on Gunsmoke. You can dance with Chester. I'm sure it will work out. Um, I, I love talent, and... Um, Whenever I'd have a comedian on, which interested me the most, and some great comedians, some of our be best and biggest stars came from that Tonight Show. What I would do is, during a commercial, when the house goes black and the mics are off, I still have a minute, two to fill, I would make a speech and say, a guy's coming on, and uh, it's his first appearance, he's never been seen, this means so much to him, and please, really, and as I'm saying this, a voice from the wing says, I don't need it. <laughs> well, I was shocked. It, it wasn't arrogance, it was just, I'm confident, I have the material, put me on. I put him on, he's the biggest sensation in show business. Watch. You know, American history, the movies, the runoff, uh, it's, it's all funny. And I wrote a piece called The Flip of the Coin, which mimicked the referees introducing the two football players. And very quickly it went something like this. Cam Hobbers is Captain Silvers. Captain Silvers is Captain Hobbers. And flipped the coin. Call it in this captain. Call heads this tails. You lose a toss, your team wins. What will you do, Captain? This captain will do whatever is to his advantage. We will receive. We will receive. All right, this team here, we'll receive. They will receive. All these guys, they will kick off. They will kick off. All right, this team here, we'll kick off. We'll kick off. What goal will you defend? We'll defend any goal you give us. Yeah. <laughs> so I took the coin. I said, well, let's take the same referee, put him back in history, see what would happen. The Revolutionary War probably looked something like this. Cam Hobbits is British. This is Captain Soldier to the Settlers. Captain Soldier to the Settlers. This is Captain Hobbits to the British. British, you're the visiting team. This is the coin. Heads on this side, tails on the other. Call a toss. The British call heads. It's tails. You lose the toss, your team wins. What will you do, settlers? All right, the settlers say during the war they will wear any colored clothes that they want to, shoot from behind the rocks, trees, grass, bushes, and everything. Say that your team must wear red and march in a straight line. <laughs> Uh, 
But there's one last thing I want to talk to you about back in history, and that is the musket. And a musket is a gun that had to be loaded a weird kind of way. It's not like today when the guys have guns, automatic, pop, 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 things. This was like a one load, one shot, load up again thing. And it must have been funny to watch something like the Revolutionary War where one man is shooting against another. And it must have looked exactly like this. <laughs> You see, things happen to me that don't happen to other people, and or, and or they happen to you and you just don't see how funny they are. I f see, my life is hilariously funny. For instance, you think of a star in the wings, you know, excited, coming out. I always thought I was, I, I wanted to be Cary Grant so bad. I didn't make it. But what happened was, in nervousness, I would walk around and mumble to myself, because I never used a script. And then I washed my hands one in the wash bowl one day, just, just nervous before I went on, and water splashed all over here. Now there's two minutes to go and nothing to change into. So you think of me backstage, the theme is playing, and here are two hairdressers with the hair blowing. <laughs> so that was either that or make an entrance on a motorcycle and, uh, and stay on it for two hours. Now about fame, I'll tell you. One time, uh, I was in Palm Springs, and uh, there's a big drug, there are big drugstores out there, enormous drugstores, bigger than we have here. Uh, they sell asphalt, tractors, everything, <laughs> enormous. So I went in there with my wife on a Sunday afternoon, and it was uh, quiet, and honestly, I was recognized. That doesn't happen often to me, believe me. No problem with me. Never was a big problem with me. But there's Jack Parr. Well, if one says it, then a crowd, before you know it, you got about eight people following me around the drugstore. Well, the problem is I wanted to get Preparation H, is what I wanted to do. <laughs> I, had a, I had a rather senior, senior case of diaper rash, and I, but I didn't want to be seen. And they're, they're, they're following me around, so I, I went around and I finally found the anal department, and I got this, <laughs> this tube and I put it in a magazine and then I bought some I bought some other junk and the crowd still following me now I go to the checkout counter and the girl takes the magazine and she she grabs the public address system shopping information yes a voice says how much is preparation H now there's a big crowd. <laughs> then he says, ointment or suppository? <laughs> 12 or 24? <laughs> Here's something you'll enjoy. Um, I love Richard Burton very much, and uh, we were friends, and uh, I'm going to tell you some stuff now. Elizabeth doesn't like me. That's the truth. I once said I wanted her to get a divorce and settle down, and she never <laughs> forgave me. <laughs> and she never forgave me for it. And she wouldn't, she had enormous control over Richard, and she wouldn't let him uh, come on. But anyhow, he, we got together and we said, he said, I don't want to talk about myself. And I said, okay, so we'll talk about uh, Winston Churchill. You have a couple of stories about Winston Churchill. Churchill, I'll get some from the library, we'll write them out and we'll rattle them off and it'll be great. He came and he was swell. He's a charming man. He was a charming man. As a matter of fact, he could charm the pants off an angel and I think he has tried more than once. <laughs> Here's Richard. What are some of the stories you were telling me today? I can't remember. I can't you remember. can't remember? Well, ask me what one of them was. I don't, let me think. Um, We'll look it up here. We'll just cut this off for a minute. Then we're going to get our notes, Richard, huh? <laughs>
Well, how do you remember Hamlet every night? I don't know. <laughs> he never gave me any notes. <laughs> That'll teach me. But we'll talk mainly tonight about Mr. Churchill. That's what we're here for, although I'm, I may egg him on to do a few other things here. Uh, tell me about the time you first met him when he came to see you at the old... Was it the old Vic at Hamlet when you were doing Hamlet? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. You want a drink? No, thanks. No. Uh, my sister's watching. Oh, right. <laughs> anyway, uh, Churchill came to the old Vic on a Monday night about 11 years ago, I think it was. And I'd had uh, what is known as a fairly rough weekend. Uh, and I decided that um, on the Monday afternoon before the performance of Hamlet that night that I should take what we call in Wales a livener. A livener is a drink to stimulate the lack of your phagocytes or whatever the word is. Well, I took a few too many and I arrived in the theatre uh, and I may say that I had my, my hair is very light, it's very, it falls all over the place unless it's solidified with some kind of thing. And I played Hamlet the last time as a very conventional uh, renaissance prince. And I had my hair, which is mouse brown as you can see, dyed black and permanently waved and my hair all curled up everywhere. And I got into the theatre and I was making up and in came the director of the theater and said, do be good tonight, he said, because the old man's in front. Now, the old man means only one person to us in Britain and possibly to you too, and that is Winston Churchill. And I said, what do you mean? He said, he's in front, he's in the, in the front row. And I panicked and I turned the cold tap on in the, uh, the faucet, as you call it, and put my head in the thing to bring myself to my senses. And my hair stood up like this. <laughs> And uh, I may not have been the best Hamlet in the world, but I was the most soaking wet, I can tell you that. <laughs> anyway, I went on to the stage and with my hair, and I was smarmed down with grease, and um, I started to play the part. And I heard this dull rumble from the front row of the stalls. I thought, what on earth is that? Well, it was Churchill speaking the lines with me. <laughs> and I could not shake him off. I tried going fast, I tried going slow, we did cuts, and every time there was a cut, an explosion would go, I always got it. He knew, that he, he, knew, he knew he would cut and he'd have to catch up with you again. Oh yes, he knew the play absolutely backwards. I think he knows about perhaps a dozen of Shakespeare's plays uh, intimately, so I'm told by his secretary. But how so did it all end? Then you thought he'd... Well, uh, generally you can't keep him for more than one act, but um, I looked through the, you know, the spy hole and he got up from his seat and I thought, that's it, we've lost him. But indeed, there he was suddenly, he'd come backstage and he said, my Lord Hamlet, may I use your bathroom? <laughs> And he did. He did. You know, I was a very lucky guy. In the 60s, it was a golden age of people. Was, I don't think it's ever been such a burst of talent as there was then. And I, a simple guy who went to the 10th grade, ended up knowing world leaders. Not, I, I am nothing, but the show had enormous impact. And then for a very strange reason, which I shouldn't tell you, my wife makes great chili. Now that sounds not to make any sense at all. Well, the Kennedy kids, Bobby's kids, Johnny and Carol and, and, uh, and Richard Nixon's children would come because of my wife's chili. And I got to know more people through my wife's cooking than I did from being on television. All of which leads me up to uh, my friends were my friends. And uh, I found this piece of film about a man uh, that might surprise you. At least I knew another side of him. All I'm going to do is show you what I saw.
Can Kennedy be defeated in 64? Well, which one? No. No. Boy, I hate a smart Alec vice president, I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, uh, Jack, I was listening to your patter before, and uh, I, I, I heard you mention each one of the Kennedys, and I didn't know which one was running at the present time. But uh, just to... Uh, just to be very serious, I know, of course, you're referring to President Kennedy, and I, under no circumstances, would speak disrespectfully even of him or of his office. Aren't you kind of just... friends? Weren't you kind of friends at one time? Oh, certainly. We came to the Congress together. I know you And were. we were low men on the totem pole and the Labor Committee together. And uh, we remained low men until he ran for president. Now, he's up and I'm down. <laughs> My little daughter said today that, you know, she says, Mr. Nixon, I'll be honest with you. Yeah, she says, I do hope that man finds work. <laughs> May I tell, uh, uh, well, you know the story, and uh, I don't color it, but I tell it as it happened uh, about your, your youngsters that happened down in Nassau. Do you mind? I certainly don't. Well, know. here's the situation. Mr. Nixon, uh, when he lost the uh, governorship of California, he was in Nassau. I happened to be uh, on this little island. We were both guests of Mr. Hartford, and we were the only ones on the island, about ten of us. And Mr. Nixon felt badly uh, about that uh, in California, but not nearly as bad as his children. His kids really took it hard. He has two girls, the darling kids. Julie got a great sense of humor, great personality, very outgoing, very funny. And the older one, Trish, is very serious. Doesn't smile much, and she was really hurt by this defeat. And I felt so sorry for them because I wanted him to have some fun. And in order to have fun, you had to leave this little island we were on, take a boat and go into Nassau where it's wild and jumping. He didn't want to go because the press would be there and the photographers didn't want to get involved in that. So I said, well, may I take the kids? Let me take the children in to the wild nightclub and let them see it. They're old enough. So he said, okay. So I took them. Trish, Randy, and Julie. Now we go in Nassau to what is called Over the Hill. It's the native quarter and it's wild, you know. Oh, it's fun, you know, jumping in the limbo and the twist. It's crazy. So I walk in and it's an outdoor nightclub and there's about a thousand people there that would be American tourists, British, and the local uh, bah Bahamian. And uh, they recognized me when they were doing the floor show and these voodoo drums are going and there's wild girls dancing. Oh, it was good. The kids never saw that. It won't hurt them. <laughs> so finally, the guy recognizes me, this uh, uh, Negro drummer. He's pounding the drums. And so he walks over and he grabs a little blonde girl next to me. And suddenly he gets this little girl out there and it's Trish. He thinks it's Randy. And she's a very prim and proper little girl. But let me tell you, she went into the wildest twist I have ever seen. <laughs> but I mean wild and crazy and a limbo, you know, this quiet little girl. And so suddenly they run out, the manager does, with a great big kind of a heathen statue and crown her the twist limbo queen of the Bahamas. They think it's Randy. So they said, your name? And she says, Trish Nixon. And the MC looks at me. I said, <laughs> He says, Where are you from? She says, Los Angeles. Are you the daughter? And he just went to pieces, you see. Well, anyhow, we go back at 12 o'clock on a little boat, and the kids go to their bed, and Mr. Nixon and his wife are sleeping. And the next morning, Mr. Nixon sees this heathen statue, see? And he said, What happened last night? <laughs> So she says, Mr. Pyle, explain it. Well, I felt like some little silly kid with pimples that had just taken his daughter out, you know. I, I said, well... I said, well, well, Mr. Nixon, we went over the hill, you see, and there was this big nightclub, and there was about a thousand people there, and they thought it was Randy, and it was Trish, and she's been crowned the limbo and twist queen of the Bahamas, and, and holy cow, I'm sorry, and... He was acting very stern, putting an act on. He said, Anne. I said, well, I'll tell you the truth, Mr. Nixon. If she had done that in Mississippi in 60, he'd be the president by now. <laughs> you know, I just can't imagine you with pimples. <laughs> yeah, I had that too. Yeah, well, yeah. Stars don't really have pimples. They get their lumps. That's what they get. <laughs> Listen, uh, Mr. Nixon plays the piano, see? And anyhow, uh, I heard some time ago from a friend of his that he wrote a selection, he wrote a, a composition. 
And we had, would you bring a piano out here if we can do this? We had uh, Mrs. Nixon, Pat, had a tape recorder going one afternoon, and she quietly uh, said to Mr. Nixon, would you, won't you play an old piece? And she recorded it. Now, that's okay. Mr. Nixon is aware of that. This is not what you call one of those trick surprises. But the funny thing is, we have hired about 15 Democratic violinists to fill out the... <laughs> We were spending more money for this orchestra than we ever spent in our life, and Jose has made a concerto arrangement of this hinky-dinky song that you wrote. <laughs> Would you play it for it? Now, Jack, let me say this. You asked a moment ago whether... You have a title? I, whether, oh, no. Uh, uh, you asked a moment ago whether I had any future political plans to run for anything. And uh, if last November didn't finish it, this will, because <laughs> believe me, the Republicans don't want another piano player in the White House. What I know about Judy Garland, uh, I could spend hours telling, talking to you about her. I knew her near the end of her life, and uh, we had uh, a lot of laughs together because Judy is, was something quite different. I went to her home one day in the morning, about 10.30, and she hadn't gotten up yet, and they told her I was there, and she came out wearing this big uh, oh, uh, garden hat. It looked like a voil sombrero, you know, at 10.30 in the morning. And I had just heard from the maid that they had just taken over her house. They had uh, foreclosed on her house. And while I'm talking to her, and we're kidding around, they come and take her car away. Yeah. So I said, geez, what can we do? We have, we have to do something here. We can't, this can't go on this way. And she looked at me and she said, darling, behind every cloud, is another cloud. <laughs> she said, let's go have lunch. And we went down Sunset in a convertible, I remember, and we stopped at a light, and um, a big, enormous limousine pulled next to us. And the window went down, and this handsome head came out, no question about it, it was Elvis Presley, whom I didn't know, nor did she. And he said, Madam, you are the greatest entertainer in the world. And she was so pleased. She just lost her house. They took her car. And here's Elvis Presley saying, you are the greatest entertainer in the world. And she said, oh, thank you, sir. So I leaned across and said, Elvis, I'm Jack Park. And the window went right up. <laughs> well, that made Judy's day. She loved something like that to happen to me. She, she was extremely witty, which you don't know about. I remember one time we were talking about a movie star... I won't tell you who, no point in it. I, I said to Judy, isn't she a nymphomaniac? And Judy said, only if you can calm her down. <laughs> when, when she was 15 years old, she made, you know, the Wizard of Oz. Well, you don't know. She was a 15-year-old kid, 14 or 15. And she told me this story. She said that those little munchkins, when she said they were a bunch of drunks, the little kids were there. <laughs> She said they kept running around picking up her skirts and picking up her dresses. This 14-year-old girl had these little dwarfs picking up her skirts. And one said to her, he said, I would like to make love to you. 
And she says, well, if you do and I find out about it, I will. <laughs> she, was, she was a great, great comic off the air. Uh, you don't know her as a talker, and, and that's what I know best about her. I do believe she was one of the world's greatest entertainers. Judy. Can we talk tonight about eight, about sure. s a silly little thing? Yes, anything you want. Anything you want. Uh, this, this is, someone's going to call this, I'm um, review this show, they'll say, uh, Punchy and Judy. Now what? <laughs> <They'll do that. laughs> uh, I know those cats, you know. But anyhow, she, what a great laugher. Terrible. She laughs, boy, at red ties, they say. She laughs <laughs> laugh like an okay. I laughed at this one. <laughs> Come on. Oh, no. Boy, you sure got over Norman Maine in a hurry, oh, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Hey, listen, hey, hey, we, she has the greatest stories, and this is one of the great talkers in show business, but no one ever heard her talk. I mean, no one, no, professionally. Um, listen, tell them about the days at MGM. There's some of the stories about Mickey and Liz Taylor and those people. Just to tell the stories you want to. Well, uh, I hardly know where to start. Um, tell me what you said about Liz. Well... <laughs> anything like no, that. No, no. Uh, uh, as you know, she's this, this marvelous sort of femme fatale. Yes. I can always just remember her as a, as a girl with a lot of chipmunks and horses, and she was only about three feet high and two years old at Metro. I can't imagine this marvelous sort of Cleopatra. She was, you know, that shows my age. Well, Liz has grown up. Yes. It? Oh, yeah. yeah. But, uh... <laughs> I laugh. She says, Liz, she always thinks of Liz well, we Taylor with chipmunks. we were a strange group, you know. Well, you know, what was in that group? Well, it was a terrible classroom in the first place. When you think of all of us in one group, with Elizabeth Taylor <laughs> in the schoolroom, you know, we went to school. It was Elizabeth Taylor, and we did, believe it or not. And Lana Turner, and Mickey Rooney, <laughs> and Freddie Bartholomew, and me, and Deanna Durbin. <laughs> That was one room? In one room, that was all it was. And, and, uh... We well, all turned out swell. <laughs> <laughs> what happened at Metro? What did they do? I don't... That was, uh... Were you kids scared? Were you scared? No, no. Not at all. <laughs> we were fine. Have you seen us since we've come out? We were a very peculiar group. <laughs> well, tell me a story about Happy Harry. Oh, I know. I know. Come on, they, they want to hear all the oh, stuff I hear. Oh, it's it, well. We we did this. Uh, my two sisters and I did it, a tour in um, throughout Washington and and uh, and Oregon, all the rotten cities, all the little cities, not the main cities, and they wouldn't let us in. But uh, 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 we did. It was a tour, so the acts stayed together for about six weeks, and uh, there was a. Uh, we followed a miserable comedian, most depressed comedian I've ever known, <laughs> uh, called Happy Harry. And uh, he, he used to come on in two. You know what that means. The, the curtain is quite a ways back so that uh, there's a lot of room. And the music would, uh, would uh, start. His entrance music was sort of... There was only three pieces in the band. Oh. Only three, there were only three. Piano, drums, and some violin or... Trumpet. I, three, so it was an empty pit with just three pieces in it. Now, Happy Harry would wait in back of the curtain, and the manager of the, the, the tour would make us wait all the way through Happy Harry's uh, act to make sure we were ready, you know. So we watched this poor thing every night. And they'd play... And he'd break to him and say, Hello, everybody, this is Happy Harry. And, and he'd go on to the most terrible stories. And we were... Well, this one time, I think... I think <laughs> you still want me to go? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Well, this, this uh, one time we hit, they put him in one instead of two, which meant he only had that much space, you know, between the pit and himself. <laughs> so we were, <laughs> we were in the wings, as usual, at the Gum Sisters, and he, when music went, <laughs> and he went, hello, are you there? Right in the <laughs> Wait. 
the he, floor. He fractured his leg in three places very badly. And we were in the wings. Can I stand up? Sure. We were in the wings, just standing. And the manager said, go on! So we had to sing Dinah, you know, we went, Dinah, is there anyone? And this poor thing in the pit was going, ah! You got a lovely need, you know that? You always did have lovely need. That dress is becoming a blouse, isn't it? <laughs> you know, it's amazing. I was just talking to the audience here. Is that is that I was. I was once the youngest radio announcer in the country. When I was 16 years old, I had a terrible impediment in my speech. And <laughs> despite that, I, I've been in this business all my life, and uh, I still have the stutter and stammer, but it's, it's, it's too late to give the money back now, you know. <laughs> Listen, um, Judy and I would get talking and forget we had other guests on the show. And one time, Judy and I talked for 40 minutes. She just fascinated me. And we forgot we had a guest backstage. It was one of those goosey nights where everything worked. No matter what I did or what I said, it was a scream. Or what she did. The thing was, I wanted her to sing a certain song. She didn't want to sing it because she didn't know it. She said, I will sing it if you hold the cue cards. Meaning, if I would help her. Because it was partly in French. And she and Goulet uh, sang. Uh, and I decided, impishly, to turn the cue cards around. And... Uh, Oh, don't say, oh, it's funny. <laughs> Here it is. Musette, Musette, my heart for you is one big throb. J'entends, j'entends, my love for you is strong enough. Your smile starts the day with the bright and gay bonjour. Your laugh. And your voices, <laughs> be the <level. laughs> 